So welcome uh, everybody. Today uh, we have a very special talk because uh, Jay is giving a talk. So I'm uh, very happy to introduce him. Um, but I think that everybody knows who he is. So I'm not gonna say too much, except to say that he's been one of the people who has uh, really been uh, pushing and, and developing methods to find invariant manifolds in dynamical systems. And we all know how important it is to get your hands on, uh, on these uh, invariant manifolds. Um, and especially in the parameterization method, Jay is basically the, the person who brought that into the, to the realm of, uh, of uh, com computer assisted proof. Uh, but he didn't just do that. He also used uh, these, uh, these local manifolds to uh, study uh, much more global uh, dynamics. And I think he's gonna talk about uh, at least part of that uh, today. So Jay, um, floor is yours. Thank you, JB. That's very kind of you. <clears throat> well, let me, uh, let's see, I'll share my screen. And uh, good morning to everyone. Thank you very much for being here. Um, today, what I wanna talk about, yeah, as JB said, it has a lot to do with uh, connections between invariant manifolds once you've already computed them. And I'm really going to be interested in this in conservative systems, systems that preserve some energy-like function. Um, and very interested in, in transversality in all of this discussion. Let me also say this is joint work with Maciej Kapinski and Shane Kepley. Uh, Shane gave a talk a, a few weeks ago in this seminar, actually about this project. But I double checked and our, our, our talks are focusing on really different aspects of this. So some of the things I'll talk about today, he mentioned briefly, uh, but those are really gonna be more like the focus of this talk, really the, the two point boundary value problems for conservative systems. Okay, uh, the application I'm gonna be interested in uh, comes from the three body problem. So, you know, you have say three masses, different sizes, they have some positions and velocities and you can write down Newton's laws. You have the equations of motion and you'd like to know uh, what happens, right? What are all the dynamics at all the different mass values? What are all the things that can happen? And this is a really old problem in uh, mathematical physics. And you maybe think that it's not uh, the craziest question to ask because things go so well with the two body problem, right? The two body problem is one of the first uh, problems completely solved in mathematical physics uh, by Newton himself, who showed that you recover the the conic sections, right? You, you, you get the uh, Kepler's laws just from studying the two bodies equations of motion. So all of the orbits in the two body problem are very nice. They're either uh, hyperbolas, ellipses, parabolas, or straight lines if you have collisions. Um, so I think for a long time, it seems like um, when, you, when, you, when you read what people were thinking hundreds of years ago, it's really hard to know. But uh, it seems like people thought this was gonna work out in a similar way for higher numbers of bodies. Uh, um, you would be able to write all the orbits down as maybe some intersections of, of level sets of uh, conserved quantities. It's just that you didn't know all the conserved quantities yet. And it was uh, Poincaré at the end of the 1800s who showed that that wasn't gonna work. While the two body problem is very nice, the three body problem, is not integrable. So I, I kind of like um, to paraphrase this as com complicated dynamics exist. So you, you should have some orbits in the three body problem that don't look like intersections of nice smooth manifolds. Uh, some wilder things are, are going on there. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about uh, the history of the problem or, or Poincaré's results, at least not from the more mathematical side, but I wanna to transition to sort of more uh, numerical studies given the, the topic of the seminar. But I did wanna mention this beautiful set of notes by Chansonier about the three body problem and, and Poincaré's contributions in the, in the whole history. But I wanna shift to talking about the sub problem that Poincaré introduced which, um, which was to make a reduction and say, okay, the full three body dynamics are at least as complicated as this reduction. And this reduction, it turns out, is gonna be incredibly complicated. 
So, so let's study it for a while and see if we can make some progress. So the idea was to take two uh, massive bodies, the larger bodies, M1 and M2, and assume that they're rotating uh, circular orbits. They're on circular orbits around their center of mass. So they have known dynamics. So you throw those equations right away. You've solved them. That's a two-body problem. You know they're moving in a circle. The equation of motion now for the third body is just a uh, one second order equation for one of the bodies. And it has these circular motions in it. But if you change to rotating coordinates, you get rid of the periodicity and you get just a nice autonomous system again, even if it has some funny terms in it. So if you write down this effective potential, the restricted three body problem. So that's the two massive bodies on circular orbits. And then you study the dynamics of a third massless particle that doesn't disturb them, but is disturbed by them has these equations of motion. And I, I show these because the form of these will pop back up uh, later in the talk. Okay, but now you say, well, maybe you, let's try to understand all the dynamics of this problem. And you can, it starts off uh, the, the, the way it always does. You look for equilibrium solutions and you find that there are five, and this can be done uh, with pen and paper. You find the straight line, the three straight line uh, equilibrium solutions that were uh, basically known to Euler and the two equilateral triangle equilibrium solutions. And once you know the equilibria, you can start trying to build up more dynamics. Uh, you do linear stability analysis. You look for periodic orbits around these equilibrium solutions. And pretty soon, uh, the idea of periodic orbits becomes really important to the discussion. Again, going all the way back, right? So really starting with uh, Poincaré's work on this problem, there's a lot of interest in periodic orbits for this restricted three-body problem. Also the possibility that, so, you know, periodic orbit is still really nice. Uh, it looks like, you know, uh, intersections of level sets or something. So there's, there's probably some things happening here that are much more complicated than periodic orbits. And this, what's I think really cool in this story is that almost immediately, just a few years after Poincaré, all of these new possibilities generated some excitement in numerical experiments, numerical explorations, numerically integrating these systems of equations, even before, in fact, way before uh, the invention of the digital computer. So there's a paper by George Darwin that I really, this paper knocks me out of my chair. This was in uh, ACTA in 1897. It's not a typo, it really is 1897. Uh, you can find George Darwin's collected works. He's a, a grandson of Charles. Uh, his collected works are all available online. And there's a paper called Periodic Orbits uh, that he wrote uh, that was published in 1897. That's just full of numerical integrations of the uh, restricted three-body problem, all done by hand. So here, here's the kind of picture that's, that this paper is full of. These are three orbits in the restricted three-body problem, one around, say, the smaller body, let's call it the moon, one around the larger body, let's call it the Earth, one periodic orbit kind of in the middle, winding around one of those equilibrium solutions. And already in, in Darwin's work, you can see you know, more complicated things. Like here in the middle of this picture is a periodic orbit. It seems to wind once around two of the periodic orbits that I showed in the previous picture. So with the modern eye, you look at this and you already see the suggestion of uh, smale horseshoes of some unstable manifold of that per first periodic orbit passing close to the second, coming back to the first periodic orbit. And if that picture is true, then there's you know very rich, there's infinitely many periodic orbits shadowing there's nearby complicated dynamics, chaos and so on. And you see this already in this, uh, these computations at the end of the 1800s. Okay, uh, I also want to mention uh, the work that came out of the Copenhagen group. So the group led by Stromjern in the first part of the 1900s. Uh, Stromjern was the director of the Copenhagen Observatory for about 30 years. And his group did, um, actually they had many people working over the course of years on numerically integrating the system 
And they kind of focused on two, they'd fix the mass parameter at one half. So you're looking at like a binary star system because this is the most symmetric version of the problem. Maybe somehow the least perturbative version of the problem. Um, and they were really interested in continuation of periodic orbits. So here's a picture from one of their books that was sort of summarizing a lot of the work that came out of this group. And you can see this is nothing but periodic orbits uh, of the restricted three-body problem with equal masses. Um, and they did, they, they were the first ones to do these kinds of careful continuation uh, calculations of families of periodic orbits, which of course leads you to other interesting objects, okay, like, for example, collisions. So at the end of this tube of periodic orbits, we're following uh, um, a family of periodic orbits out of L1. This family seems to accumulate at a collision, and it, it's a kind of a more dangerous collision than you see in the two-body problem. There's no straight lines here. This is really something where if you saw a part of this orbit, it would look like everything was going fine, but all of a sudden it winds in and collides with one of the primaries. So there's like a, a warning here that the collisions uh, are, are maybe a bigger problem, maybe more complicated than you thought. Um, here's another family. It also seems to uh, grow and grow and then sort of have a funny uh, twist in it and then come back to, to a collision. And there are lots of these pictures uh, in, in the work of the Copenhagen group. But these aren't theorems, right? These are, this is numerical evidence for uh, kinds of orbits that um, look really interesting to study um, that are really coming out of numerical experiments. Now, of course, when the digital computer came on the scene, there was a huge renewed interest in all of this. And I'll just mention some of the names that people would want to read. Uh, the literature now on numerical experiments, and these, even in just the restricted three-body problem, that literature is enormous. There's also a, 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 a substantial literature on pen and paper work. You can prove lots of things by hand about the system, but those proofs are often based on uh, perturbative methods. So maybe you perturb out of the Kepler problem with one of the masses huge, one of them very small, and the other one massless. And you can use that you know the dynamics of the Kepler problem to do things. Or maybe you look at things very far away from the center of mass so that it's, uh, you're looking at dynamics at infinity and you can do a lot of nice perturbation theory there. Or there's variational methods that give you the existence of a lot of objects, but then maybe you're, you, you, know, you don't know so well where they are. And also collisions are very difficult to, to manage with variational methods. So the, the point is still after all of this time, when you look at a picture like this with this collision and you're in a system that's uh, far from per perturbative and you're kind of at the inner dynamics near the, near the primaries and not, not very far away, uh, it, it can still be hard to prove theorems about objects like this. And so it's a natural place for uh, computer assisted proofs. Now, since I'm starting off with, uh, with, with history, I'll change gears and talk about a little more history. So the, you know, once this computer assisted proof started to be developed, it didn't take too long for people to say, well, let's, what can we say now about celestial mechanics? Uh, let's, you know, so I'm not going to talk about the beginning of, of computer assisted proofs, but kind of when they started to be turned on uh, or used to look at celestial mechanics problems. So one of the earliest papers, maybe the earliest, you know, computer assisted proof about a, a real problem in celestial mechanics is this paper by, uh, by Alessandra, 1997, where they did uh, KAM um, analysis in the Sun-Jupiter system with the uh, series asteroid. Uh, and there's a, the, a full book about this um, that came out in 2007. A couple of years later, there's a proof of chaotic behavior, not in a three-body problem, but in a two-body problem with a shape of the second body. And that fact that the second body has some shape uh, perturbs the dynamics enough that really interesting things can happen already in a two-body problem. So this paper by uh, Stouffer came out in, in the year 2000. In the next year, uh, Burza Makino, this paper using uh, COSY to just integrate initial conditions in the three-body problem appears. 
And uh, they make a really nice point in this paper, which is anytime you take a small set of initial conditions in the, say, a celestial mechanics problem, say the restricted three-body problem, and you integrate them for longer than you've ever integrated them before. If that's done rigorously, then you now have a, a theorem about non-existence of collision for that set of initial conditions. So just doing rigorous integration with no other geometry is already giving you uh, nice information, letting you prove theorems about non-existence of collisions. You know how, how long a certain part of phase space solutions exist um, before they might blow up. And this is information you didn't have, right? Okay, uh, the next year though, gets to this uh, beautiful paper by Gianni, uh, studying the dynamics in the restricted three-body problem and really going back to these uh, orbits from uh, the work of Stromgern's group. Uh, Gianni worked on the Copenhagen problem, the binary star system, equal masses. And Gianni found, I think it was uh, six or seven, maybe seven symmetric periodic orbits in this problem and showed that he could construct a horseshoe uh, in the Poincaré section and get symbolic dynamics across all seven of these uh, symbols. This gave him uh, entropy estimates and, and uh, all kinds of complicated dynamics and showed that you could prove the existence of these old periodic orbits. Um, and so this is more like the, the, um, the style and the, 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 today's talk is kind of in this tradition, right? It's going back to, to Gianni's paper in 2002. And then, you know, the, this, this started to grow, right? There, to, after this, there's a lot more interest in this. Um, uh, Piot and Thomas proved the existence of the a number of choreographies the next year, including the figure eight. Uh, Daniel, in a series of papers in the next few years, extended this work that Gianni had done to more, uh, to, to actual Sun uh, Jupiter mass values. And then this 2005 paper actually had very long periodic orbits involved in his uh, symbolic dynamics. So, you know, he had Sun Jupiter, but then these long periodic orbits that go very far away from the Sun and Jupiter and come back and then the symbolic between dynamics between those and other orbits. So it's starting to be able to really prove the existence of very complicated uh, dynamics in, in realistic systems. Um, a year later, another paper uh, involved Yanni doing some choreography work, but now it's changing the, the approach to a more functional analytic approach. And then I wanted to mention at last this paper by uh, Tomas and Carlos Samo, where they proved a number of things, uh, uh, many asymmetric choreographies, but also the stability of the eight. And then I told myself I was gonna do look at a 10 year window. Okay, so this is about the arguably the first 10 years of computer assisted uh, proofs in uh, uh, celestial mechanics. So, you know, you could kind of go on all day because this only accelerates and there's a, a, a ton of work uh, done on these things by now. Um, but so the, 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 the point of this slide is not just to celebrate all of this early work, um, but there's this very interesting uh, phenomenon that when new tools become available in, in mathematics, that we always come back to these problems in celestial mechanics and see what new things we can prove. And so this, is, this was really the start of that. Um, if you're really interested in computer assistive proof and celestial mechanics, because one could do a whole talk on just that and, and really still be kind of skimming, um, the, all the authors just list, listed have lots and lots of papers in celestial mechanics. A number of other authors that, that you might want to look into if you're really interested in these things. Uh, a lot more recent uh, work going up to, you know, uh, hours and days ago. Um, the talks in this series by uh, Macek and Renato, and I already mentioned Shane, and uh, one of the student talks, Max and Murray, these all had to do with computer assisted proofs and celestial mechanics. Uh, so there's a lot more references in those talks, but this is a, still a very active, uh, something a lot of us are very interested in. And next week's talk by, uh, is by Alessandra about uh, KAM 
and computer assisted proof for KEM and quasi periodic solutions and invariant tori. So, in, the, in my earlier list, I focused a lot on periodic and connecting orbits, but we'll hear much more about quasi periodic solutions next week. Okay, so what I want to turn to now is to collisions to something like this, because one thing that it's something that's not really uh, already in the literature in any of the um, uh, papers that I just mentioned, or even things that have come after uh, computer assisted proofs for collisions. Although, you know, Gianni does mention you way back in that paper in 2002, that some of the proofs might be easier if you use levi Civita regularization. Um, it, even when you don't have collisions, passing near the primaries can make your proofs very, very difficult. Um, and, and that's something I, that maybe I'll talk about a little at the end of the talk as well. Okay, so I want to pivot now from like the setup to, to, to really the material of the talk. So I'm going to use, the, the, you know, this is more a talk about using tools from validated numerics than it is a talk about any particular validated numerical method. So I, I really need two, two things, very standard ideas from uh, validated numerics, from computer assisted proof. And these are newton kantorovich newton krychak methods and, and validate, validated integrators, okay? So here's a uh, kind of newton krychak theorem or newton kantorovich theorem. This is the kind of theorem that all of us use in all of our papers. It basically says if we have a nonlinear system of equations and equations and unknowns, if we have an approximate solution to that system, and if we can measure some, somehow, uh, okay. So we have an approximate solution and that's a vector. We have a, a matrix A, which is an approximate inverse for our derivative. If we can measure how well that approximate inverse does it inverting uh, the derivative, then if we get good measurements, so we have our, how good is our approximate solution? So if this Y is small and how good is our approximate inverse? So if this Z is small, then we can prove that our system of equations has a unique solution in this ball where we chose to uh, study our derivative and our approximate derivative. So our derivative and its approximate inverse. And uh, very important for this talk, not only do we get the existence of a zero, not only do we have it in a ball, but we have that the derivative itself is invertible at the true solution, okay? So all of these are inequalities. If you have your map F and you have its derivative, you can check all of these things using interval arithmetic. And again, just stressing that the non-degeneracy of your solution, the invertibility of the derivative at your true solution is part of the conclusion of this theorem, not, not an assumption. Okay, uh, just a few remarks on this. The proof is just to study this uh, Newton-like operator. And if you look at the proof, so you, you know, you'll see that uh, in this seminar, there are at least two styles for talking about this theorem. Some people like to talk about set inclusions, one set being mapped into another by this T operator. So that's more like uh, how you would see the statement of newton krychek uh, Some of us like to write this as a statement about norms, about some uh, inequalities being small. But if you look at the proof of the, of the theorem, these are basically two ways of viewing the same thing. You're, you're trying to show that this T is a contraction mapping and it sends some set into itself. Okay, these ideas go back also a long way, at least to the interval analysis book by Moore a more modern reference, I'll, I'll mention Tucker's book and also the, the notes by, uh, by Rump in 2010 in Numerica. And then here I have the uh, website for the InTLab program because this is what I'll use today in, the, in any of my programs to do interval arithmetic, uh, InTLab. Okay, and we've had talks here in this seminar series that really focused on kind of the ground level, the nuts and bolts of uh, interval arithmetic. Um, Okay, validated integrators. This just means I look at an initial value problem. I need an algorithm that's gonna produce for me, say some polynomial or other finite approximation and a number R that tells me how close that finite approximation is from the true solution on some interval. And if the validated, if the validated integrator works, you know, existence of the solution on that time interval is, is part of what I get from the integrator. 
I can use validated integrators to solve systems of equations like this, which give me, you know, they let me, this lets me flow initial conditions. This lets me compute the derivative of the flow of initial con with respect to initial conditions. And it lets me compute the derivative of a flow with respect to parameter. And these are the kinds of things I'm gonna need in the rest of my talk. So uh, in, in, in the rest of my talk, I'll have a lot of flow, flow maps and derivatives of them and even derivatives with respect to parameter. In practice, the way those are computed is just with some validated integrator. So um, in fact, this big system that's computing the, uh, it's integrating, it's solving the variational equations, it's computing uh, the variational equations with respect to parameter. These equations have a lot of structure which can be exploited in Lohner algorithms to very efficiently get all of this information at the same time. Okay, and there, there are papers, in fact, you can even do higher derivatives, uh, higher order variational equations uh, to get second derivatives, third derivatives of the flow with respect to initial conditions. Uh, and we've had talks in this series about validated integrators, uh, even as recently as uh, last week. And uh, so CAPD is a fantastic package, you know, that makes all of this kind of standard. And that's how I'm going to treat it in, in the rest of the talk. And there's a very nice uh, preprint here on the archive about uh, describing, discussing CAPD that I wanted to make some propaganda for. Okay, well, now I can get, get into the, the topic of the talk, right? So the, what I want to do um, is discuss a, a, a framework or, or a setup uh, for actually for two point boundary value problems in conservative systems. And not just when I have one vector field, but when I maybe have many vector field changes of coordinates between them. Um, and this setup, you know, it'll let us talk about collisions, but it can also be used for studying connecting orbits between various hyperbolic objects, you know, if you have that object and, and you parameterize it stable and unstable manifold, then the connecting orbit is just solving a, a boundary value problem. Um, also connections say from equilibria to collision or from periodic to collision are also um, orbits that might not go through collision, but just pass so near collision that you want to, to, to change coordinates and regularize that collision. Uh, this setup will work for these kinds of things. <clears throat> So I need to set up a little bit of notation. So by a conservative vector field, I just mean a vector field. I mean, I have a pair, I have a vector field and I have a, a, a function from my phase space into R um, that, that satisfies this uh, infinitesimal conservation property. So the gradient of E is always uh, perpendicular to the vector field or maybe vice versa is a better way to say that. I don't know. Um, at any rate, this is what I mean by saying F conserves E. And you can check if, if this first definition is satisfied, then when you look at E along an orbit, okay, you take the derivative, that's a function uh, for fixed X, that's a function from R to R, you take its derivative, you get this expression, you plug in uh, the fact that you have a solution of the differential equation. I'm now just, instead of writing this complicated phi thing, I'm just writing Y because it's the same in both slots and that's zero. So the derivative of something is zero means that the thing itself is constant. So it's good to, you know, to prove a couple of little things as we go along. So a, no a notion, once you have this idea of uh, a conservative vector field, some quantity conserved as you integrate is, a, is a, you're interested now in the level sets because this is where all the dynamics have to happen. So by MC, so I'm using M for manifold. So the, the like the level set manifold associated with C, which is only a manifold in most places. But so the no notation for level set here is MC. It's the set of all points in my coordinate system that have a fixed value of energy. So if you're at a point where the uh, gradient of the energy is non-singular, so a, a, a regular point uh, for your energy, then this level set is a manifold near such a point and you have a nice uh, characterization of the tangent space that will, that will be important a little later in the discussion. So you're in the tangent space of this level set if and only if you're perpendicular to the, um, to the gradient of your conserved quantity, right? Okay. Now, here's the setup I wanna talk about. 
as I kind of already mentioned, I want to imagine that I have an initial coordinate system. So I for initial, I have some open set U, I have some vector field defined on U and it can serve some quantity E sub I. So my initial coordinate system, my initial vector field, my initial energy. And then I have a second coordinate system, second vector field, a second uh, energy functional. So let's look at two different energy level sets or, or yeah, level sets of this conserved quantity in these two coordinate systems. So an initial uh, level set and a final level set. Okay, I have some submanifolds in these level sets. And um, suppose that their dimension adds up to the dimension of the level set, one minus the phase space, okay? So I'm gonna call these the initial and final shooting surfaces. So that's why they're S is for shooting. So S initial, S final. And then let's say I have maybe a bunch of other coordinate uh, patches, a bunch of other open sets and a bunch of maps on these open sets where each of these maps maps from RD to RD but has a free parameter that's in minus A to A. Okay, so, so this is, this is uh, the setup. Now I want to find a point on my initial shooting surface that's mapped by all of these maps to the final shooting surface. Okay, so you, you compose all of these uh, R1, R2, R3, R4, and R5. And at the end of the day, you arrive at the final shooting surface. That's the shooting problem I wanna think about. So I'm looking for an X1 on the SI and an alpha in this uh, parameter interval for R so that R takes X1 into the final shooting surface. Okay, that, that's the, the setup for the problem. Now, what, what you should think about, you know, because it, it, it's maybe, Maybe it feels like a change of years. These R's, they can be time steps for some flow map, or they can be change of coordinates. And they can be those things in any combination you want. So you think maybe you take a bunch of time steps, not uniform, you know, as, as short or as long as you want. Uh, you move away from your shooting surface. You change coordinates to some other vector field. You take a bunch of time steps. You change coordinates again. You do this back and forth as many times as you want. Finally, you change into your final coordinate system and you wanna hit that second shooting surface. Okay, so a bunch of these maps might be uh, flow maps and a bunch of them might be coordinate changes. And that's a, this is the idea. So the, the, you know, the, where would you use this? Of course, this is, this is the setting that I have in mind tough for talking about collisions is you, you have the restricted three body problem, you have the levi civita regularization coordinates you can use around one or the other, uh, the primary or secondary body that allow you to go through collision. And then you, know, you wanna move between those coordinate systems and study some, uh, shoot between some manifolds, maybe collision manifolds, so on. But the same setup could also work for just ODEs on manifolds, maybe you have, uh, a uh, manifold defined by some collection of charts. You have a vector field on that manifold that you can project down to the charts. And when you get close to the boundary of your charts, you can change coordinates. I won't talk about that setup today, but this, this framework would work for doing those kinds of problems as well. Okay, so what is this alpha parameter? So this alpha parameter is uh, an, an unfolding parameter and I want it to have the following behavior. So suppose I pick a point in my initial level set, then I want it to be mapped to my final level set by R if and only if alpha is equal to zero. Okay, this is just something I'm assuming about all those maps are the R1, R2, R3 that I'm composing. They all had this alpha parameter in them. And I want to assume that only when alpha is equal to zero does the initial energy level, is it mapped into the final uh, energy level. Okay, that's, that's the role of alpha. I mean, it's strange, the role of alpha is to not be there at all, but you'll, you'll see why we need it, okay, as, as we go. All right, um, now I just wanna point out if I, if I kind of uh, define these new variables, so I, I let my 
my initial point, I call it x1, the image of that x2, the image of that x3, and so on, then you can write the derivative of this total map R in a nice way. It's just the product of a bunch of uh, matrices evaluated along this orbit. And of course, the derivative of R is invertible only if each of these matrices is invertible. But if these matrices are coming from time steps and coordinate changes, then all of these matrices will be invertible. So that's something you can cook into your thinking about this problem. Okay, so I wanna to try to set up now, you know, I mentioned that the main tool of this uh, work was gonna be this, uh, Newton, this uh, Newton Kantorovich type theorem. So I wanna to try to set up an equation solved by my uh, shooting. So to do that, I wanna actually parameterize these uh, initial and final shooting surfaces. So let's call di and df the dimension of the initial and final shooting surfaces. Uh, I'll take some disks in rdi and rds, and I want parameterizations of si and sf. So that's ki and kf, these are my parameterizations. So then I can define a map, f of u, s, and alpha, where u and s are in di and df, like this. R of ki, okay, where the variable for k is u, and then I have the parameter alpha minus uh, the kf, the parameterization for the final shooting surface. If I have a zero of this, then I have a point that starts on si and ends on sf. Okay, it's so, so a zero of f solves the shooting problem. There's my picture, right? So if I've solved the shooting problem, I also have alpha bar equal to zero. That comes from what I've assumed about the unfolding parameter, okay? But now if you count the dimensions here, you know, the, the di times df, the dimension of that is d minus one. So I have this other interval that alpha is coming from. It gives me one more dimension so that my domain of this map is rd, okay? So alpha is, is there to balance the system. It's, uh, um, it appears because we're, we're working on these level sets. So we need this additional variable. Okay, so with, so that map F gives me N equations in N unknowns. Okay, if it's a composition of a bunch of derivatives, then R takes that initial shooting manifold diffeomorphically into the final uh, shooting surface, and I can actually look at a neighborhood of uh, that point of intersection, and that's going to be a, a, a nice little disk the same dimension as SI. Okay, so now I have two manifolds. I have the image of SI, the image of the initial shooting surface under R, and I have the final shooting surface. They intersect. It's natural to ask about transversality. Okay, and transversality here can only mean transversality in the energy level set. So these manifolds can't intersect transversely in the full space, only when you restrict to, the, to, to this uh, level set MF. Okay, which means you have a robustness, but only robustness with respect to conservative perturbations. Now, the, the thing I wanna claim about this setup is that the non-degeneracy of F implies transversality of this intersection. And you can see this by looking at the derivative. So, you know, there's the derivative. Uh, these are the blocks in, the, in that derivative. It kind of initially looks like a big mess, but it, this, I think it's actually very nice. So you, here's my uh, initial point, map to the final point. That's my, the solution of my shooting problem. Now we're just looking at the derivative. The tangent space of the shooting surface at this point, uh, you know, the image of U bar under the parameterization K, it's given by the derivative of K. And same with the tangent space uh, at the final shooting surface. Now, if I look at this manifold RSI, so this is uh, the initial shooting surface being pushed through the map R. The derivative pushes that tangent space along. So I have a expression for the uh, tangent space. It's the derivative of R then acting on the tangent space of the original manifold. But that's my first block of columns of the derivative of F, right? So it's, it's a little messy, but, but that basis is sitting right there in that matrix. And then the next term in the derivative is the, uh, it's a basis for the tangent space 
of SF, right? It has the minus sign, but that just flips that, that vector the other way. So if I let, uh, I'm just gonna talk about X bar as being my initial point on SI and Y bar being the final point. And I suppose that the, the gradients of the energy are um, non-degenerate there so that I really do have an energy manifold near uh, X bar and Y bar. What, you know, the, the assumption that this derivative is invertible says that those columns are linearly independent. So these, these vectors, this tangent space for the image of the initial shooting manifold really do not interact with the tangent vectors of the final shooting manifold. And they're also all uh, vectors inside the tangent space. Because if you have two sub-manifolds of a manifold, then their tangent spaces are subspaces of the tangent space. So now if you count the dimensions, right, you add these up because they're linearly independent, you get a full D minus one number of vectors, but that is the dimension of the tangent space. So the columns of this matrix do span the tangent space of the, um, of the uh, level set at your target point. And so you have transversality as soon as you have a zero of this problem. And it's isolated, it's isolated intersection point by the dimension count. Okay, um, now that map, that F is actually not the map you really wanna work with. You'd like to work with a multiple shooting version of this so that instead of uh, compositions of matrices, you just have to invert a large structured matrix. So I'd really like to look at this map. This map has a zero if and only if the little map had a zero. And I claim that non-degeneracy of the little problem implies, well, if and only if non-degeneracy the big problem. So to see this, you look at the derivative of the big problem. I'm gonna maybe go a little bit fast through this part, okay? Because it's just a calculation. Uh, the idea is assume that that intersection is not transverse. I'm gonna show that the uh, big matrix must not be invertible. The multiple shooting matrix can't be invertible if this intersection is not transverse. So if this is not transverse, it means the columns of that matrix are linearly dependent. So I can find a non-zero vector in the kernel. And that gives me this last equation here in the middle of the page. I'm gonna use that equation now to build something in the kernel of the big matrix. So remember I have uh, this relationship on my variables for the big uh, map. I can write the derivative this way. This was uh, an observation from several slides ago. So let's kind of keep what we've done so far. The important thing is that uh, fact that that vector VIVF is in the kernel and that we have this expression for the derivative in terms of the derivatives of the submatrices. So now I define this vector, okay? Its first component is VI. Its second component is the image of VI under the derivative of K. Third component, the image of V2 under the derivative of the first map and so on. So the last component is zero because um, I'm not using the last column of my little f matrix that doesn't really appear in the transversality discussion. And the second to last component is the VF. So if you start unpacking, like if you look at V3, V3 by definition is uh, the derivative of R1 acting on V2, but then you use the definition of V2 and that's the derivative of K acting on VI. And you kind of go up the ladder and you unpack these things, you get these relationships. Okay, and then finally, if you let the derivative of Rn act on that last vector, you see that you get the full derivative of the map R acting on the derivative of K. Okay, but that is the first column of this matrix M that you started off with. So it's, it's just a natural way to try to find this uh, vector in the kernel. So now I wanna look at DF acting on that uh, v, we'll take that component wise. So that's, I'll call that result B, that's B1 through Bn. Again, this is just remembering uh, the relationship we have because we picked something in the kernel of M, remembering the formula for the derivative, remembering the definition of the Vs. So now if I let those Vs hit that matrix Df, I have uh, these equations in the components. 
And now if you start unpacking, well, wait, remember what V1 is, right? V1 is VI. And what is V2? Oh, well, it's DU. It's the derivative of K times VI. Well, that means that first component of B is just gone. Okay, and you work through those equations, you know, plugging in uh, what is V2, what is V3, what is V4 in each of the equations, and you get that everything is zero to the last equation, which is zero because uh, the VI and the VF were in the kernel. Okay, so if the intersection is not transverse, then that big matrix cannot be invertible. So if that big matrix was invertible, if you have a non-degenerate zero of this big F, then you have a non-degenerate zero of the little f. If your gradients are uh, non-zero at the initial and final point, then you, your level sets are manifolds, and then you conclude that everything is transverse. Okay, so solving this big F of x equals zero problem with Newton's method gives you automatically a transverse intersection of, of these manifolds in the, um, in the energy level set. Okay, now what about this unfolding parameter? This is sort of the mysterious part in uh, this discussion. So um, let me talk for a minute about the unfolding parameters. This is really coming from, uh, so kind of adapted from papers on numerical continuation for periodic orbits. Um, but again, there's, because we're taking this a posteriori approach, there's a little bit of work to do to make that adaptation. So let me show you what we do here. Again, let's now focus just back on one vector field, one conserved quantity, okay? I wanna say that a new vector field G, it's an additive unfolding for the field F. If any time I look at a solution of the differential equation where my vector field is F plus alpha G, okay? So I solve that differential equation and then I compute this integral of the solution, I, I look at the solution plugged into my, the gradient of my energy, I dot that with my unfolding field, that should never be zero. So if this, what does this condition mean geometrically? This is saying that G should push orbits out of the level set. If an orbit is in the level set, then this integral, this quantity would be zero. And then when you integrate it, it would be zero. So if G is kind of destroying the level set uh, on orbits, I mean, some point of an orbit might stay in because something goes up and something goes down. But when you integrate, uh, no open set should, should stay in your level set. So this is, this is somehow G's role is to, to destroy the conservative structure. So that's, what a, that, that's an unfolding, uh, additive unfolding because it adds in in this nice way. Okay, suppose you have such a thing. Um, then you look at, an, again, any orbit of that vector field, F plus alpha G, your initial energy is equal to your final energy for any orbit. So that means they're only, you know, the ever equal if and only if alpha is equal to zero. Okay, so alpha really is destroying the uh, conservative structure. Let's just look at this real quick. So, so you take such a solution. Um, let's compute the derivative of E at that solution. Okay, uh, that's the gradient acting on x prime, but we know x is a solution of the differential equation. We have the uh, bilinearity of the uh, inner product. That first term is zero because E can serve, well, F can serve E. And the second term is the term there in our uh, definition. So the derivative of E is this uh, gradient of E dotted with our, our unfolding G. Okay, so I have this formula, let me save that. Now, let's look at the initial and final energy. I can rewrite them uh, as this integral, but I can rewrite that derivative as this inner product, that's the earlier line. And then this is equal to alpha times a certain integral. And the assumption is that that integral is not zero, okay? So if alpha is not equal to zero, this difference can't be equal to zero because the integral is not equal to zero. So two non-zero things can't be zero, zero when I multiply, they're just numbers. Okay, so that's that direction. If, uh, on the other hand, I have the initial equals the final energy, then that difference in energy is zero. And so then this product of alpha and the integral must be zero, but since the integral is not zero, it has to be that alpha was equal to zero. Okay, so this, 
this is the little proposition about these unfolding parameters I want to use. Uh, the implication for the flow is that if I start in the, uh, if I start in a energy level set with any set of initial conditions and I push that forward at all, then they stay in that energy level set if and only if alpha is equal to zero. And that's exactly what I needed, you know, for this unfolding parameter in my setup much earlier in the talk. Okay, so how do you find an F or a G? Well, there are a couple of different ways. So uh, one way to do it is that the gradient of the uh, energy function always gives you a unfolding. To see that, you just compute. Uh, if I take G to be the gradient of E, then when I compute this integral, I just get uh, basically the L2 norm of uh, E. If E is non-degenerate, then this is zero at only isolated points and so on a non-constant solution, uh, this is greater than zero. And that's what I needed in the definition, right? But sometimes you'd like, uh, you, you'll find, especially like in numerical analysis literature, you don't always wanna, you know, the gradient of E might be a pretty complicated expression. So adding alpha times that to your vector field maybe makes things a mess. A lot of times you like to use other things. So here's another idea you can use for unfolding. If you have systems like this, this is a mechanical system, like in the beginning of the talk. You can rewrite it as a vector field, and you can see that it always conserves uh, this quantity. So every vector field that comes from a second order system like this is conservative. And you check that just by expanding things, and seeing everything collapses. And all of the, you know, the restricted three body problem, the hill problem, restricted four body problem, all of these rotating uh, problems in celestial mechanics have, have this form. Okay, so there's the vector field, there's the energy. Now I define this projection onto the velocity coordinates and take that as your unfolding. So that's actually an additive unfolding for any system of this form. And you can see this, you just by computing, you see that that inner product is minus two times the velocity. So when you integrate it, you get something non-zero as long as the velocity you just have to check that for systems like this, and you can see this just looking at the form of the differential equation, uh, your velocity is zero on open sets uh, only if um, you're, you're a constant solution. Okay, so that gives you a really nice way to unfold the kinds of problems we're talking about here. So I can finish up now with trying to describe kind of quickly an application of this to celestial mechanics. So it's the circular restricted three body problem. Let's go back to that. Okay, there's the vector field, there's its energy. So that's my initial coordinate system. And you know, this is well-defined except at those two points uh, where, the, where the primaries are sitting. So I have, that's my initial coordinate system. Now the Levi-Civita regularization, um, I can do it at either one of the primaries and I obtain a coordinate system that double covers my original coordinate system because it sort of works through the complex square root. Um, but locally, it's a, it's a diffeomorphism. So I get this uh, as my regularized vector field. So FP is at the primary, FS at the secondary. These conserve their own energies. These formulas are maybe a big mess, but somehow the point just is that there, there are formulas, right? And then I have the transformations that take me from regularized coordinates back to the original coordinates and again, inverting these always involves a choice with the branch of the square root, but modulo that choice, you, you have diff diffeomorphisms locally, as long as you're away from zero in the regularized coordinate systems. Okay, so this is a setup like I started out at the beginning of the talk. Now there are a couple of helpful things uh, I'll just remark about these regularized coordinates. Um, the singularity, let's say at the large primary, which in the original coordinates was at mu zero, 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 that gets mapped to the origin and the regular coordinates. The regularization, I didn't mention this, okay? The regularization only works if in your original coordinates, you fix an energy level. So you don't regularize all collisions at the same time. You regularize collisions in a particular uh, energy level set in your restricted three body problem. And then the Levi-Civita transformation takes you, uh, so first of all, that value of C ends up being a parameter in your field. And the Levi-Civita transformation takes the energy level C in the original problem to the zero 
zero energy level in the regularized problem. This is why in my setup, I didn't want to have my initial and final energies necessarily being the same because in problems they won't be. But what you want is that a certain known energy level is mapped to a certain known energy level. And you have this with the levi civita transformation. So you only ever look at zero energy level in levi civita It's the C that changes in the problem itself, depending on what you picked back in the original coordinates. Okay. Um, and, and then you have that these transformations behave like you want them to. They map uh, the level set C in the original coordinates to Z in, in, in the regularized coordinates and vice versa. Okay, what, now let me say, what is the collision set? So you're a collision in the regularized coordinates if your positions are zero, okay? And since only the zero energy level set matters, let's just look at it. Let's write down energy equal to zero. If you plug in zero for all the x's here, this reduces beautifully and you get that the collision set is, is, is a circle, which you can parameterize. If you go into the coordinates of the secondary body, the same thing happens. So you, you have these three vector fields, you have transformations between them, they all preserve some energy and you have this parameterized set in the regularized primary and the regularized secondary that correspond to collisions in the original coordinate system. So this is starting to look like a, the shooting problem from the setup. So here I'm going to let Ki be the parameterization of the collisions at the primary, but then plus a little bit of a flow. And then Kf, my final surface, to just be collisions at the secondary body. So then I get the right dimension count. So I need to sort of thicken up that first collision set, make it a tube uh, to get the dimensions to come out right. Okay. Then to get the alpha, what I'm going to do is anytime I'm in the original coordinates, I'm going to include the unfolding parameter. So I won't put it in my regularized uh, flows only in the uh, uh, original coordinates, because that's the simplest of the three vector fields anyway. It just makes the formulas easier. So I, I only use it then. And now I can define this map that says, start in the primary coordinates on the collision, it, collision set, flow by an amount uh, tau, which is actually one of my variables. I get to a point, then I transform back to the regular coordinates. I flow there for a time t1. I transform to the secondary coordinates. And then I flow for a time T2, and now I want to be at the uh, at the collision set for the smaller body for the for the secondary body. So a zero of this is um, is a ejection from the primary collision set, arriving at collision at the smaller body. Uh, it's a balanced system. The T1, T2, and C are parameters that I have to choose. And um, this has the property that it maps these um, shooting manifolds to each other in the right way because of the levi civita transformations. Okay, so here's a uh, example of a ejection collision orbit that we can prove using this idea. This is not symmetric. So we took uh, mu equal to one four here just to break the symmetry and have something where we, uh, this is an example where you want this whole, uh, unfolding parameter setup. Um, I think if I have one more second, I'll just quickly show, you know, another place where this could be useful is say you have a uh, parameterized the uh, unstable manifold at L4, which I'll assume my mass uh, ratio is big enough that this is uh, 2D stable, 2D unstable. So I have a 2D unstable manifold at L4. If I look at the boundary of that, it's a 1D arc, that local manifold. And if I look at that plus a little time, I'm going to take that to be my initial uh, shooting surface. And then I'll shoot to uh, the collision set of the primary body. So my initial shooting surface is uh, starting on an unstable manifold. My final shooting surface starting on a uh, ending on a collision set. You can you know, write down a system of equations just like before. Um, 16 equations and 16 unknowns. But the nice thing about the way this is all set up is let's say instead of taking one time step for T1, you want to take 100. It doesn't change any of the, the problem's properties, right? 
So, you, you know, here's an example of a computer assisted proof where we start on the unstable manifold of L4, we take 500 steps, we then change coordinates, then we take 150 steps before to, to shoot to the collision set of the primary body. So this gives you a, um, a L4 to collision orbit. And, you know, you use the uh, validated integrators to make all of those little phi maps rigorous. You use interval arithmetic on your coordinate changes. And you use the Newton Krychek argument from the beginning of the paper. You get the uh, existence of this orbit with everything transverse. So this is robust relative to conservative perturbations. I think I, I could say uh, uh, some things about homoclinics and periodics, but I think I'll go ahead and just stop there. Say thank you for listening today. And also especially uh, thank you for everyone participating participating in the seminar these last months. This has really given me and John Philippe and, and JB something to look forward to every week and, and keep us going in, the, in this difficult time. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Jay. I guess you showed some pictures so people can ask uh, questions about them uh, at the, quickly at the end. Huh? But uh, let's open the floor for, uh, for some questions. May I ask, may I start? Of course. So, uh, so actually, I didn't quite understand uh, how you finally get uh, uh, that alpha, this unfolding parameter alpha is equal to zero. So do you use this proposition and, and, um, and, and then show that the energy level at the end and at the beginning is the same? Yeah, sorry, that, that did go very fast, okay. So let, let, let's, I don't know, maybe the best place to look is, uh, is here. So you know your uh, initial shooting manifold is in the zero energy set of the regularized coordinates and so is the final in regularized of different coordinates. And you know the only energy, the only way to get into those energy sets is from you know the energy you picked in the original coordinates. So in this, if you can see my arrow, you know if this this um, okay this t of these uh, regularized coordinates ends up at a point that then gets mapped into the zero energy level set of the uh, uh, final coordinate system, then I must be in the same energy level set uh, the whole time I'm flowing in here. Okay, so I have the, in other words, this point, this X1, P1, Y1, Q1, and this point have the same energy. Okay, so if my initial and my final have the same energy, then alpha was equal to zero. That's finally That's a so it's it's a part of the, of it's a part of the fixed point result, so to say that finally that the energy level is the same at the beginning and at the end. So the energy level is the same at the beginning and the end because of the Levi Civita transformation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that's that's a property of you know that has to come from your problem. Um, so you 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 know that these are going to send a points into the zero energy level. Uh, only if they're in the appropriate energy level in the in in the restricted problem. So that must be from the beginning. It must be an inherent property of the task you are solving or of the problem you are solving. Right? So you know you must know that your coordinate transform. I mean, if these are coordinate transforms for like a conservative system that that you're matching together, then they need to send energy energy levels into energy levels. Yeah, right? okay. So they, yeah. they should be good physical changes of coordinates. Um, or if you were on a manifold, you know, and you were you you, you were changing uh, coordinates, you know, th th these things would have to be adapted to that conserved quantity, or or they're not good coordinate transformations. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's that's the point. That that is, yeah. Thank you very much for yeah trying to get that said in a in a more precise way. Well, thank you for your answer. Thank you. Other questions?
So yeah, why, why don't you tell us a bit more about what you didn't have time to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, okay, so, you know, I can mention that uh, this setup can be used for, uh, for example, for, for home eclipse. So I, I talked about shooting from an unstable manifold to a collision manifold. Of course, you could shoot from a unstable manifold to a stable manifold. And uh, so there are these really nice homo clinics going back to the, the papers of Schromjern, where they were following families of periodic orbits. And this led them to these, what they called asymptotic periodic orbits, infinitely long periodic orbits that nowadays we would call uh, homo clinics for L4. And so these, these pictures of these orbits have been around for ages. But uh, to my knowledge, for example, none of the orbits in, in, in this picture ha have been proved. So you know, using this set, so here, here's the shortest one. So we, we can prove that using this setup and that doesn't require any, any really changes of coordinates. Um, and this is symmetric, so you could prove it without these unfolding parameters and so on. But here's an un unsymmetric connecting orbit. It passes a little closer to the uh, primary. So for this proof, you know, you need the unfolding parameters or, or something to deal with the uh, asymmetry. And it's helpful to change coordinates when you're near the primary. It makes this proof easier. Uh, there are lots of other homo clinics that pass much closer to the primaries, and we're in the process of trying to see which ones we can prove now. Uh, but, you know, for example, something like this, when you regularize, when you change coordinates, should really be no harder than something like this, right? They, they're roughly the same length. It's just this one passes is much closer to the primaries, but in, when you regularize this, this doesn't really matter. With these homo clinics, the fact that you get transversality automatically is really nice because then you have these theorems of Devaney and Hernard. So anytime you prove a theorem like this, so for these are both proven orbits, uh, if you have transversality, which we get automatically from the proof, then you have uh, chaotic dynamics nearby and you also know that there's a tube of periodic orbits that uh, accumulates to each of, uh, each of these homo clinics. Um, so the transversality here is giving you really more than robustness. It gives you a lot of dynamical information. Thank you. And these proofs are all done in MATLAB? I mean, Shane, when he does the integrator, it's done in MATLAB? So th this is actually... Uh, so this is different, different from the part, this doesn't use chains integrators. This is just using some homebrewed integrators I cooked up. Uh, and it, yeah, it's all in, in MATLAB. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, of course this would be faster. The performance would be better in CAPD, but Machik and I like to kind of check each other's work. It helps us find each other's bugs. So I have my integrators in MATLAB and he has his in, C in CAPD. So these proofs you can see, like this one took a long time. It takes 20 minutes, but that's because I'm using kind of my homemade uh, MATLAB codes. Okay, thank you. I have maybe a kind of technical question. So when you have to do this change of uh, coordinates, uh -huh. like uh, from one to the other and then back and so on, do you have a kind of good heuristic to know in advance when to change or do you have to play with that uh, manually, let's say? A good heuristic, if you look at the, just the vector fields, you see that the, um, the regularized vector fields have these big polynomial terms. Okay, so you, know, you have something that looks a little bit familiar over here. You have something to the, to the three halves power, but you have you know, 16 times a cubic, and these are kind of a, a fifth order. To, you have a big polynomial terms here. So if you're too far, too far, too close even to magnitude one, these big polynomial terms start to hurt you. So it's kind of nice. The uh, original problem is really bad if you get too close to the primaries. The regularized problem is numerically problematic if you get too far away from the origin. So what we usually do is, is we, we, you know, if we're within say a radius one half of, of, of these guys, we change coordinates. If we're in a radius of a little bigger than one half over here, we change back, things like that. And, and that gets a nice balance, you know, in the numerical stability of the problem. I see, thanks. Yeah. 
um, I have a question. Ah, hi, Johnny. Uh, uh, hi, Jay. Uh, very nice. It's really very nice, and I love this topic. Um, uh, my question is, um, from variational calculus, it's very well known that uh, there may be periodic orbit that collapse to collision. So a big issue when addressing these problems with critical point theory are collisions. But uh, uh, so your solutions are collision. But my question is, can you prove or are they limits of uh, periodic solutions? Or can you prove that? Oh, that I, I, I really appreciate the, the question. So if I go back, in fact, all the way back to, to Stromgen's uh, work, you can see here, uh, th this is a family of periodic orbits coming out of the uh, L1 that seem to accumulate at a, at a collision. And if you regularize it, it numerically, people have, you can even go through this collision and you get sort of a new, the family keeps going. So yeah, I've given one talk about this. Shane has given one talk about this project. Machek should give even another uh, talk about this project. So we have done continuation validated with, and this part uses CAPD, where we do uh, continue this family. We can show that it goes to collision, through collision, and, and, and come out the other side. And all of that works uh, beautifully with the computer assisted proofs. Okay, that's great. But that's param then you're doing parameter continuation with respect to the energy in the original three body problem. Yeah, Thanks. you can do that. That's that's interesting. I think it's particularly interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the, we've worked on this also. Yeah, great. I have a second question, which is concerning maybe a little bit of an outlook. So um, do you have a view uh, um, how far you can generalize that to partial differential equations? So where, where, where the, 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 the phase space is infinite dimensional? I mean, uh, In principle, all, all these fixed point, all these arguments are available. So it seems to me that, that, the, that the essential parts of the techniques are available, are available, but I'm not quite sure in how far you can go through with this Levi Civita uh, concept, with this, with this um, yeah, with these transformations. I would have to look to see. I mean, f first of all, the Levi Civita really does use that you have a conserved quantity. So you'd need to have a PDE that, that with a conserved quantity. Yeah. Um, then I would have to look to even see papers about PDEs, about regularization of singularities and Levi Civita for PDEs. I'd almost be shocked if, if there weren't papers sitting out there. Like, but I, I, my, my answer is I, I, I don't know. But it sounds, yeah. let's talk about it over, uh, over a beer next year yeah. somewhere. <laughs> Hopefully, we can do that soon. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. At least that would be from my point of view, that would be an interesting, uh, interesting extension, of course, as you can imagine. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds fun. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you. Other questions? Uh, Jay? Yeah, Thorne, hi. Can I ask you, hi, uh, among like this, um, this computation that you presented like with roughly 20 minutes in MATLAB, do you have like an insight of what is the most, like, the cost, the, the, the most costly part in the computation? Yeah, I mean, so, so look, this is like a not super optimized code. This is like Taylor integrators that I wrote last summer. Um, just cause I don't know, I don't know what's wrong with me. Um, but I mean, do you think it's a Taylor part that is that cost? Uh... Yeah, I mean, each of the little Taylor steps, each of the little validated Taylor steps, you know, if it takes uh, a, a, some portion of a second and you're, you're doing uh, 550 of them, then it, you know, it starts to add up. So yeah, the real thing is making that Taylor step as fast as you can. And like, you know, in CAPD, these are just, I think yeah, this I mean, minute proof would take less than a second probably. So I think it's taking a long time just because it's uh, my code is is validated, but it's not it's not fast. Okay. So that's why I think. Yeah. But I think a nice thing, you know, one nice thing about this setup is when somebody comes along and they write a better Taylor integrator or 
uh, you and John Philippe write a write a better one in Chevy Chev or something. You know, all of this, the, the, the setup itself is agnostic to that. So better integrators just make the method work, work better, right? My, maybe my question was like, do you have like other examples of other configurations where it was really more than 20 minutes and it was not a, like, not possible to compute it or? No, but we're still we're still kind of yeah, get getting started on. So, like I said, uh, for these homo clinics, I've I've done these. I haven't even tried. Uh, so this is one from the earlier picture. So this one is done. This one I and this one and this one I I don't think you're going to be any trouble. This one I start to worry about my little homemade Taylor integrator. It's going to take a while. Okay. Or, or this one. So for these over here, I would rather. Uh, rather use uh, CAPD or something much faster than my code, not faster than CAPD. Okay. Hmm. Although that would be nice too. Uh, thank you for the beautiful talk anyway. Well, thanks a lot. I know I, I started having to rush <laughs> in the, about the last quarter of the talk, but uh, that's okay. That's better than rushing through the first part. So that's... Uh... I, I always get too interested in talking about the first part and I find I'm halfway through the talk before I really start saying anything. Anyway. Any other questions? If not, uh, Jay, thank you very, very much for this beautiful talk. And thank you to the audience for joining us and I hope you join us again next week when the, the topic will be KAM uh, theory and uh, computer statistics results for that uh, again in celestial mechanics by uh, Alessandra Saletti. <laughs>